All right, what's up, Wild Chat Sports Podcast? I'm with Cecil Shorts here, the legend himself, wide receiver, NFL wide receiver with the Jaguars, Texans, and Bucks. Uh, so, Cecil, I mean, it's a crazy time, man. Uh, but you know, maybe just uh, talk about how you got into the game of football. I mean, you started at Collinwood High School in Cleveland. You played yeah. quarterback. You know, what were your expectations? You know, like, you know, did you know, like, you wanted to go into the NFL from day one? It was it was always a dream, um, but it didn't become reality to a lot later in life. So in high school, I was, like, under-recruited. I was getting a lot of, a lot of love from, like, um, mid-major Division ones like Akron, Buffalo, um, Eastern Michigan. Um, and then come December of my senior year, they all disappeared. They said, hey, Akron is the only team that, was Division One like, hey, you know, we're not going to offer you a scholarship, but you can walk on. I'm like, I'm not about to walk on. I'm going to go D1 somewhere. Long story short, I didn't, I wasn't blessed with the opportunity to end up going D3. Um, now, if you know anything about Division Three, you pay for your school. Like, there's no scholarships, no athletic scholarships. Um, it's just you go there and you, you know, you play for the love of the game. So for me, it was frustrating. I kind of felt like I let my my family down. I let my my friends down because I was the star. I was the star quarterback, quote unquote. I played four sports in high school: baseball, basketball, football, track. And to me, I was just as good as the guys going D one at other schools. I'm like, why am I not getting looked at? Um, but it ended up being a blessing in disguise. I went to a Division three school called University of Mount Union. And um, if you know anything about Mount Union, it's like the Alabama, it's like the Clemson, it's like the LSU of Division three. Like we're we're top notch down there. I think out of the last, we have twelve national championships now. I think. Wow. Out, of last, out of the last 15 years, we've probably been to the national championship at least nine, eight or nine times. So we're yeah. always in the, in the competition for getting that. So long story short, um, I was a quarterback my whole life. I go to this school and I'm the backup. I hurt myself my freshman year. I run track that spring uh, and become an All-American. They're like, hey, how do you feel like, how do you feel about playing receiver? I'm like, nah, I ain't playing receiver. I, I thought I was Michael Vick. Michael Vick's my yeah. favorite. <laughs> Mike Vick, man. I yeah, 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 yeah. But they had an All-American quarterback at the time named Greg McKaylee, and he was only a sophomore, and I was a freshman. They're like, the fastest way for you to get on the field is to play receiver. So I registered my first year. I come next year, and I'm like the sixth receiver. There's five seniors in front of me. I'm the sixth receiver, and I'm like the third-string quarterback. So I'm playing every week just because we blow everybody out, right? We literally yeah. blow everybody out. Mm-hmm. So two, that's 2007. 2007, we made the national championship. We lost. 2008, my first full year starting at receiver. It was crazy. But long story short, man, everything worked out. A friend of mine named Pierre Garcon actually got drafted in the sixth round in 2007, I believe, or 2008. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. We, I, was, I was looking at that, man. That's crazy. Yeah, you because he once he graduated, that's when you really got that playing time at wide receiver at Mountain Union, right? Yeah, and then, you know, I kind of I kind of followed in his footsteps. And once he started, like, really balling, because he went to the Colts. He got drafted by the Colts in the sixth round. Mm-hmm. So he played with Peyton Manning, and he went to the Super Bowl and played with against the Saints when they lost. And he was, you know, he played like 12 years. But because he was doing well, the scouts started coming back to our school. <laughs> like, let's see. If you know anything about the NFL, it's a copycat league. So they're like, let's see, you know, who else is going, what else is going on there? And I happen to be doing really well. So, like, I'm a lot of my, you know, I'm thankful for Pierre a lot because he kind of paved the way for me and, and other D3 guys to get a look. Yeah, man. I mean, you killed it. Like, you got, um, like, I was looking at it, you caught, like, over 70 passes, close to 1,500 yards, 23 touchdowns, uh, you know, which set the Ohio uh, Atlantic or athletic uh, conference record, um, ultimately helping Mountain Union uh, win their 10th NCAA Division Three National Championship. Uh, yeah, man. I mean, that's just like a crazy story, you know, like going D3. I, that's when you also uh, broke another record, right? You were the highest uh, drafted player in Mountain Union history and first player ever by uh, – ever first player drafted by the Jaguars from a di- Division three school in franchise history as well. So, I mean, talk about like that grind of like, you know, mentally going in the NFL draft, which is tonight, right, coincidentally. Mm-hmm. Like, how do you keep that mindset? Like you know, you're you're, you know, going in the bigs. You got all these guys going D one, and how do you stay mentally focused despite going Division three and, and going into the draft with confidence? 
it was tough, man. So I spent, you know, after, so 2008, 9, and 10, I had three years left, and I kind of balled out all three years. And then going into the draft process, it got real. Mm. Like, you know, for, for put it this way, Division three, like, we play at 1 o'clock mainly. We might have one or two night games. And then um, we're watching the big-time guys play, you know, at nighttime. So Ohio State's on TV watching Ohio State. If Notre Dame on TV watching Notre Dame, you know, whatever SEC yeah. game is on. Yeah, yeah. So I came out in 2011, and I had a chip on my shoulder. I'm like, yo, I got to prove myself that I'm, you know, I can be a player. I get to the combine. I see Cam Newton. I see Julio Jones. I'm like, yo, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, snap, that's Cam. That, that's like, you know, that's Superman. Like, you know. <laughs> so I had to get that fan, that fan, like that fan, like fandom out of my brain. Like, listen, let's just focus on you right now. Let's show the world, you know, you could be a guy in the field, you could be a, a good player in this league and, and that you belong here and that everybody made a mistake that you didn't go to Division One. So, um, you know, it, it just, just keeping that mindset and focus, like I got to prove the people that believed in me right. I, I can care less about who, who didn't believe in me, but the people that did believe in me, I wanted to prove them right. You know what I mean? Like just prove, okay, yeah. listen, I know I can do this. I appreciate y'all. And then prove to myself, like, listen, you know, I'm I'm here for a reason. I, I know I know I can play ball. You know, the biggest the biggest difference between D three and D one, in my opinion, is the is the O line and defense alignment. Like they're in, it's a it's a big difference. Yeah, like you go yeah. from clowning on one side of the ball. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah, Going yeah. To get my you know six one six two tackle. You know what I mean? It's a that that's the biggest difference. But you can find athletes anywhere. But as far as you know, the biggest difference is is definitely O line D line. Yeah, no, for sure, man. So, like, uh, you said you were tight with Pierre. Did he help you, like, you know, going into draft night saying, listen, man, if, if I could do it, you know, you can too. Like, were you guys tight throughout that process, you know, during you know, the time where you could you were about to get drafted? Yeah, he definitely checked in on me. Uh, and, he, and he still does. T- we talk every now and then. Um, he's the type of guy that uh, doesn't say too much. But, you know, if, if he's checking on you, he you know, he's showing love to you. So, he was just like, you know, Hey, I'm excited for it. You know, this is an opportunity of a lifetime. Take advantage. Yeah. You know what I mean, and um, it was just pretty cool, like seeing both of us once we got there, both of us in the league. Yeah, being able to play against each other and see each other on the opposite sidelines and stuff. So it was, it was tight. Yeah, that's that's unreal, man. So you, uh, did he ever talk to you about like the stardom with Peyton Manning his first year? Like, was he like, did he have that same like? You know, initial reaction when he came into the league, like, yo, shit, like, I'm playing with Peyton Manning, like, this is crazy, like, you know, what what was it like for him? Did he talk to you about that? You know what? Um, it's funny, because, like, he would, we actually went down there, myself and two other of my teammates, was it his rookie year or his sophomore or his second year? We went down there, we kind of just hung out with him in Indianapolis. We went out in the town, we had a good time. Um, but he didn't mention, like, too much about Peyton besides like he's about his business mm. like it's 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 serious like mm. when it's time for him to play it's it's time for him to play he's not the type that's going to be out there moseying around you better know your job know where you're supposed to be be where you're supposed to be at and Pierre did a great job you know I think a couple of years he had uh 800 yards with with Peyton and that was behind Marvin and, and Reggie you know what I mean yeah. so he was there in the, in the in the end of those years so um Peyton is a real a real professional um, and as you can see, he has a great personality, it seems like, you know, yeah. off the field, but, but yeah. on the field, like, he's, he's, he's no joke. Yeah, I see him all, like, I don't know, I see him all over, like, the commercials and stuff, and it's just hilarious, you know, because he seems like a funny guy, but, like, um, who was it? We, we talked to, uh, like, Chris Gronkowski, too, and he said he played on the same team with Peyton, like, with the Broncos, and he was, he said the same thing, like, yo, like, Peyton's locked in, and then it's just so funny because I see him on these commercials. He's cracking up jokes. It's just like he's hilarious, right? <laughs> you know, because like I feel like Brady has that too. Like they they just have these goofball personalities, but like when it comes to game time, they're just like locked in. You know? Well, I think well, that's what makes them great though, because like mm-hmm. they're they're obsessive with being productive. They're obsessive with winning. They're obsessive of doing the little things right, and that's why they're so successful. That's why Peyton's been. I mean, uh, Brady's been able to play. 20, 20 some odd years, and then you're you're from almost Boston, right? And you're Boston. Yeah. You see, you know, him his product his, his production forever because he pays attention to the details. He takes the game so serious, but at the same time he enjoys it. Um, 
you know, that's why he's, he's so successful. Even even Michael Jordan, that, that documentary is going on right now. You can see <laughs> the intensity in practice, like his intensity is even talking. Yeah, like, I don't I don't agree everything he says, but mm-hmm. he's like, you know, listen, I'm here to win. Like, I don't yeah. care what goes. Like, he had a broken foot. He's like, no, I'm, I'm we're playing to win. That's the only reason yeah. we play. I know. I feel like there's mixed emotions with like MJ, you know, like playing with him. But hey, I mean, he got the job done, you know, he. Yeah. Good, but I actually haven't seen the documentary yet, so I have to check it out. I mean, you need listen. I know, I know you up there near Boston. <laughs> Are you a Celtics fan? Oh yeah, man. Oh yeah. Okay, so I know you might have some reservations. They do, they do talk about Bird. Yeah, and yeah. A little bit. I, I heard a little so bit about that. Out. That that stung a little bit, man. But <laughs> hey, I got to accept it. He's the goat. He's the goat. But um, but yeah, man. I mean, that, I mean, your your story is incredible. I mean you know, take us through that moment when you got drafted, you know, what was going on in your head when they called your name? Man, so we were, I knew I wasn't going first round, right? I'm like, that's out the gate. I'm not going first round. Um, but we heard some rumors that, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an optimistic guy. So I'm thinking I can, I can go as high as possible. I went to the NFL combine. That was a great experience. I had a pro day. Um, you know, I, I did the whole night. I met with Jerry Jones. I met with different teams. I had workouts with the Patriots. I had workouts with different mm-hmm. teams. So I'm thinking, okay, if I can go third round, that would be amazing, right? Yeah. So my dad has this, like, uh, <laughs> my dad has this. My dad's, like, constantly talking to my agent. And my dad has his clipboard. And he, and he wrote down every receiver's name that's, like, rated above me in the draft. Yeah. And uh, he had a list of, like, I think I was, like, a 25th receiver, 26th receiver on somebody's, you know, board or whatever. But he had, like, a list of 40 receivers. So every time a receiver got drafted, he just scratched him off. Scratched him off. Julio went up. Okay, scratch him off. Good. <laughs> he was rooting for guys to keep getting drafted so I can go higher. <laughs> right. Yeah. So we were, hoping, we were hoping third round. It didn't happen. So I was kind of, like, upset because the second night, you know, that this, the first night is Thursday. That's first round. The second night is second and third round, right? It's Friday. So I'm hoping for third round. And, then like, there's a bunch of people over my house. Nothing happened. So I was kind of distraught. I'm like, you know, I'm getting my name called tomorrow. I know I am, right? So Friday's uh, – Saturday come, and it's fourth round. And my dad, is, you know, he's still scratching names off doing his thing. And my agent called me like, hey, there's not too many names being called right now for receivers. I'm not sure we'll get a run. Um, you know, just just be aware we might go fifth, six, or maybe even undrafted. Just just be aware of that. So my like feelings was hurt. I'm like, oh I'm like, yeah. what? Yeah. Ten minutes later, Jacksonville Jaguars called me in the fourth round, the 114th pick. <laughs> and I'm on the phone and I'm like, okay. Okay. And I just started smiling. I'm like, this, this, this is it. I'm like, Jacksonville, <laughs> everybody in the house goes crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got to step outside. And all, all of them watch it on TV. When they announce my name on TV, everybody goes, ah! <laughs> <laughs> Wait, how many was, people did you crazy. have over? You know what? So, with 22 days, it was probably over 100 people. And we had a small house. Mm. So, it was just family and friends that, you know, been around since, since I was younger. Been around since... Um, you know, just since forever. You know, we try to yeah. keep the, the family tight, the friends tight. We ain't having no stragglers in there. You know what I mean? People that came out of nowhere. So just yes. some of my close college friends, close high school, middle school guys, and then some family came over. So it was cool. But it's close yeah. to about 100. Just random people popping in saying what's up. It was, it was <laughs> just like that. Yeah. Dude, that, that's unreal, man. That's unreal. So did you know, like, right away, once you got that phone call, you were like, yo, this is it? Like, or, or is it like... I didn't. I didn't. Yeah. I was... It's like, I know every draft pick goes through this, right? Like, you tell nobody. Nobody call me. Nobody text me. Don't do nothing. Leave me alone. I need my phone. <laughs> and, like, somebody called and, like, just checking on me. I'm like, man, don't do that, man. Like, <laughs> I forgot. Another team called, like, hey. Um, okay. Then they hung. I forgot what team it was. And then Jacksonville's up calling. But Jacksonville didn't tell me they were going to draft me right away. They're like, hey, just stay on the line. I'm like, what am I staying on the line for? Like, what hey, you like, doing? What? Yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, just, just be patient. We're going to draft you. I said, oh, I'm like, oh, this is crazy. This is this is so much fun. But it was, I had no clue. And I didn't think Jacksonville was that interested. So I met him at the East-West Shrine game. I met him at the Combine. But I met other teams, too. And other teams were seen more interested, like Dallas, Baltimore. Um, 
I think those two seem more interesting. So I'm like, okay, that, those that'd be cool to go to. And then Jacksonville came out like, yeah, we wanted you from the start. We thought you were the best receiver at the Shrine game. We wanted you here. We, I'm like, oh, cool. It just, it just it's interesting how different teams either really show their hand or they're really like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Hiding it. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, I was just curious. I mean, you know, since tonight is like draft night and all that, um, you know, I just didn't know like what it, what really goes on in the players' heads. You know, once you get that call, are you, you know, are you are you chilling or you know? But it's good that, uh, I mean, yeah, it seemed like it was a crazy night, man. I mean, it must have been. Were you stressing out or were you? I was uh, like stressing out before I got drafted. Or just like when you got like when you got that initial call with the uh, Jags, where they were like, "Oh, hold on the line." Like, was it was it excitement? Was it like? It was to be honest, it was a little stressful because everybody was yelling and talking and asking mm-hmm. me questions, and I'm like, "Yo, let me." I can't hear what they're saying, and I'm like, I didn't want to be rude to anybody. I'm like, "Be quiet, be quiet," because I couldn't hear what was going on. Everybody was so loud, right. so I had to step outside and talk, and then it was the big hug and cheers and everything um but it was it was it was it was a little bit of stress i'm sorry if you hear my daughter in the background yeah no you're good you're good you're chilling, a little bit you're of stress <laughs> and uh there's it it a lot of emotions going man but it's like you worked so hard to get to this point and it's finally here you yeah. know what i mean it was it was it was awesome yeah what, what i mean what was it like you know first day of practice with uh what in like mjd and daryl smith and and all those guys, like you're a D three player, and now you're playing with all these big names, man. I mean, what, what was it? What was that like? Like first day of practice, like it was crazy. Yeah, MJD is really short, um, and you don't realize how short he is until you see him. <laughs> but he is a beast. Yeah. Oh, my rookie year, he led the league in rush like sixteen hundred yards. Couldn't be stopped. Yeah. Um, unbelievable player, Daryl Smith. One of the funniest guys on the team. This he is a, the true pro. Just worked hard, made plays. Super, super, super country dude. I mean, so so country. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was some awesome guys. Awesome guys. Mercedes Lewis. It was just some awesome guys on the team that that were true professionals, true pros. And to see them when I've been watching them my whole life, or you know, grew up watching them on TV, or whatever the case may be, it was a surreal, it was surreal. Yeah. And I had to get over that moment. Like, okay, listen, you're a pro too now. Like, now yeah. you're a pro. Yeah. You're just a yeah. pro just like them. So start acting like it. So I started asking them questions. I started, you know, quizzing them and um, really getting to know who they were. And I learned how to be a pro from those guys. You know, we, I, I, I modeled or emulated certain things they did as far as taking care of their body and going through different things and, and really being a professional. Be one of the first ones there, the last ones to leave, the hardest working in between. And for me, I, I know I wasn't the best – uh, or the most athletic, but I knew if I could be a pro, I, I could be around a good amount of time. And um, that's one thing that helped me stay, you know, six years in the league is just being a pro, being a professional. Make sure I wasn't getting trouble off the field. When my opportunities came, I made plays. Um, I helped the young guys out. I was just a, a, a pros, um, I guess a professional. And mm-hmm. coaches and, and, and really coaches and GMs and upper management really appreciated that. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. I mean, you killed it. I mean, what what was like that first, you know, that first year between like, cause um, like Gabber got drafted that year, right? So you had Blaine yeah. and uh, Gerard, right? So yep. was the quarterback competition, like you know, that first year was there, you know, a sense of uncertainty or you know, feeling in the locker room. Well, first of all, you do you do a good job with your research. Um, <laughs> sec- secondly. <laughs> It was crazy because the year me and Blaine got drafted, it was the lockout year. Mm-hmm. So similar to – it's not not how it is now, right, because nobody can leave the house now, right? But as far as football-wise, we couldn't, we couldn't talk to anybody in the front office. We couldn't talk to the coaches, nothing like that. It was only the players. So mm-hmm. after we got drafted, I think Dave Garrard hit me up, which was crazy. And, you know, he was like, you know, we're going to fly you and Blaine down for some 707 work. I'm like, oh, cool. So we flew down. We had a good time down there, got some work in. And then we didn't hurt. We didn't talk to those guys or see those guys again until training camp. Normally it's OTAs. Like normally draft process, you get drafted, you get like a week off, and then you go rookie mini camp, then you go OTAs, and, you know, all this stuff and, and mandatory mini camp, and then you get a break. 
and then it's training camp. We didn't get none of that preseason stuff, right? We went from draft day straight to training camp. So within that time, the first day of training camp, me and Blaine and the other draft picks are in there. There's a whole team meeting. And the first thing they say is, Blaine Gabbert is going to redshirt this year. He's not going to play at all this year. Dave Garrard is our quarterback. Blaine will compete for the job next year, but David is the quarterback for this year. Well, David didn't have a great preseason, and his back was bothering him from the previous season. And they owed him, I guess, around nine. I don't know what. Well, they owed him some money or whatever. Long story short, they end up cutting him. They cut David Garrard. I didn't see it coming. I wasn't. I'm a rookie. I'm, I'm bright eyed. I'm just trying to learn the plays. I'm, I got everything else in my mind. I'm trying to figure out, you know, what apartment I'm going to stay in, whatever. They cut him the week before the season started. So we had Luke McCown as our starting quarterback. And we won the first game. We lost the second game. And then they, Blaine Gabbert started the third game. Was Blaine ready? Hex no. Was the offensive line good? Hex no. So the next three or four years, Blaine struggled just from his rookie year getting hit and sacked so much. Blaine is an extreme talent. I mean, he has all the, all the arm talent in the world, everything you want from a quarterback. But because in that situation we rushed him and we put him behind a bad offensive line, it's a bad situation with not too many playmakers around him, it was end up not working out for him at all. And kind of – it was a rough start to his career. Now, now he does a good job, right? He, he's a good backup now. Right. Now he kind of revived his career. He won some games with the Titans and, and some other people, some Tampa Bay, I think, and he's doing really well, right? He's not mm. nearly the same guy he was when he came in. Mm. But I think he could have been so much better if mm. he really would have had that red shirt year and if he really would have had a better offensive line and playmakers around him. And it's just like when you rush a guy, you can see how bad it can turn out, right? Yeah. And for me, I watched yeah. first hands. I, I truly believed in Blaine. Blaine could throw any pass, any ball, it's just when you're 20 years old, I believe he just turned 20 and when he was drafted, and you're put in a situation that it's like, oh, like you're, it's no, it's no win situation. Like he's ultimately he's going to fail. It was, it was frustrating for him. It was frustrating for all of us. And he got, he got all the criticism, you know, quarterback gets all the blame and gets all the praise. So it was, I'm glad to see him bounce back, but it never was a competition. It never was a quarterback competition. It was rig on red shirt blame. And then, Three, four weeks later, they cut David Garrard. It's like, whoa, like yeah. what? <laughs> yeah. What's really going on? Yeah. So after that, it was just, it was just interesting, man. That the franchise yeah. never bounced back until, I guess they went to the AFC Championship in twenty sixteen. Yeah. Like that's when it's Yes, the Pats. Yeah, they had y'all, man. Yeah, I know, they man. You got me. You got me worried, man. <laughs> uh, yo, yeah, I mean. Yeah, because you play with Chad Henney too, right? Like, so. Oh, I love Chad. Yeah. Chad, now, I grew up, now hear me out. I grew up in the Ohio State. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. I was taught to hate Michigan. I can't even say Michigan. Hate the school up north. I was taught to hate them. So I grew up watching Chad Henney and Mike Hart and Jason Avant and all those guys, Steve Breston, all those guys, right? Terrell, or is it Brandon Terrell? No, it's something Terrell. David Terrell. David yeah. Terrell and all these guys. So it was just it was just interesting to it was pretty cool honestly to play with Chad and he's one of my he's one of my favorite quarterbacks I played with. Man. He fed me the ball. We had a good little connection going on. So Chad was yeah. he was really cool. Yeah, dude, you killed it that year, man. I, I see you. I see you. I mean, you had over, you know, 900 receiving yards. You had s seven touchdowns. Like you were the guy in Jacksonville. Like you were the guy for them. Um, you know, how, how much confidence did that give you, you know, in 2012, you know, you know, you went from a year of deep division three player, you know, to you know, uncertainty of where you were getting drafted to being really the main guy for the Jaguars. Like how much confidence did that give you moving forward in your career? It gave me a lot of confidence, man. Um, that, that 2012 year was crazy. I never forget. So Jack Del Rio and his staff got fired. Mm -hmm. They brought in a whole new staff. I think it was Mike Malarkey and his staff. And our receiver coach, Jerry Sullivan at the time, he wrote down every receiver's name in the depth chart. And my name was the very last name going into 20, 2012. And I said, I called my dad and said, hey, I'm making this team. And they're not going to get rid of me. There's no way that's going to happen. And I bought into everything Jerry Sullivan said. And he loved me. 
And he is the reason I was able to play, you know, the years I did in the NFL before I got injured. He was the reason I, I was a, a, a decent receiver. I did everything he taught me, um, and it worked. It translated to the game. And I think I'll end up being the starter week eight. I wasn't the starter at all until, like, weeks – no, it might have been earlier than that, like week six, week seven, somewhere in there. And um, it was just – it was awesome, man. It was surreal to be, be able to make plays in the NFL. You know what I mean? Like, be a playmaker. You know what I mean? Right. It's like, I'm really doing this. And it was it was cool, man. Um, now, to be honest, it was a battle, too, though, because, you know, after that year, there was high expectations for me. And I battled some injuries the next two years. So I didn't necessarily live up to the expectations that I wanted to. And when you're losing, they always find somewhere to blame, right? So they were saying, oh, the series are not good enough, or the series are not good enough, all this stuff. And I let, let some of that stuff feed in my head. And I never thought I was good. I started to doubt myself, right? And I'm like, it was just a constant battle. It's a constant battle to stay confident, stay believing in yourself. And it's like you're always trying to prove that you can play, and it's still not enough, especially when you lose. So it was, it was frustrating. Even after that 2012 year, I was very confident. But it was frustrating to go out there um, when certain – coaches or staff didn't believe in you. And I, I'll be honest with you, it was, it was, it was never necessarily me, but it, this losing is tough. Right. So like, I wouldn't say the coaches staff, my, my coaches love me and I love my coaches. That was never an issue, but it was an issue with like, I don't know. It's hard to explain it. At times, I doubted myself, and I shouldn't have. I should have stayed confident. If I can go back to a certain certain years, I'm like, man, just continue to believe in yourself. But it's tough when you're losing and coaches are saying this and saying that or the media saying this and saying that. You got to just stay focused, man. You got to stay focused. Like, you got to really block all distractions and focus on you and what you can bring to the mm -hmm. team. And at times, I did well, and at times, I struggled. So it was like an up-and-down thing. But that 2012 year was surreal, man. It was crazy. I had yeah. like two game winning catches. It was just nuts. Like it was, yeah. it, was it was like storybook type stuff. So 2012 was a special year. Yeah, man. I mean, you killed it, man. I'm pretty sure I had you on my fantasy team that year. I was like, yo, I gotta pick this guy. <laughs> He's killing it, man. He's killing it. I was like, don't sleep on Cecil, man. I gotta pick him up. So um, no, overall, man, I mean, that was a crazy year. I mean. Uh, you, know, it, it, you know, like record-wise, it was tough, but like, I mean, you guys like killed it, right? I mean, I think that's like, you know, you killed it, you know, personally. I mean, that was, you know, incredible year. Um, you know, was it hard for, you know, was there someone like that you were tight with on the Jaguars? Like, who, was the, who are you most tight with? Like, who is your boy on the Jags? Uh, pretty close. So, that, as a I'm sorry, you broke up a little bit. I'm sorry. All the, can you hear me now? Yeah. All the receivers, we stayed really close, man. So whoever was in the room during the season, we was tight, man. If it was mm -hmm. Justin Blackman, if it was my dog Mike Brown, A. Sanders, um, whoever was in the room really from 2012 to 2014, we were super tight. Like, I still talk to A. Sanders, Mike Brown, um, a lot of the guys. Justin uh, – Jordan Tyman, he was a running back then. I still talk to a lot of the guys, man. Will Rackley, Cam Bradfield, Kevin Rutland. It's a lot of the guys that you, you know, you hang around. It's like college. I was there four years. So it's like, <laughs> it's yeah, like college. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you just build relationships. Um, and it was fun, man. But like, I guess the main guy I still talk to a lot, probably Mike Brown. He was a receiver from Liberty and came on the team. And he played there, I think, two or three years with me. And then he ended up going to Carolina. But he's actually the receivers coach now at the University of Cincinnati. Um, but we, we we come we kind of stay probably often. I don't know. We, I, lately, it's been like every once a week. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we come we, we, we kind of stay a lot, man. So when when you when you build, uh, when you're on the grind with these guys constantly, uh, you build a respect for each other. You build a love for each other. They're like your brothers. You know what I mean? Yeah. Have you uh, have you checked in on MJD during this time or? <laughs> man, he's so busy. Yeah, we we have talked a little bit. To be honest, um, he, he, we commented on the – I was reading some book I posted on Instagram. He had commented on We chatted a little bit. But he's doing big things, man. He's doing, uh, I believe, TV and radio for the Rams, um, all over NFL Network, writing and do different stuff. So he's he's big time. He's still, I still look up to him. He's a guy that's doing well with the transition from, uh, you know, out of football. And uh, he's doing a really good job. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, I, I know I don't want to keep you, man. So if you need to head out, I don't want to – 
I want to keep you, but um, yeah. I mean, what, what's is there a time crunch you got or? I got about five more minutes in me. Five more minutes. Right. Yeah. Um. All right. But I guess the last few questions. So there's uh, someone I know. She's a diehard fan of the Jaguars, uh, Kendra Middleton, uh, and she wanted me. Uh, she wanted me to ask you how did has the culture shift in the Jaguars organization, you know, changed throughout the years. Um, you know, maybe have you heard anything about the current culture there there is today, or I mean, what what was the culture like uh, back then when you were on the team, and how, maybe how has it changed? Well, when I was there, we were trying to build a culture, right? So mm-hmm. Jack Del Rio, my, I got drafted in 2011, and that was the last year Jack Del Rio he got fired in the middle of the year. So they brought in another coach in 2012. He got fired after that year. They brought in Gus Bradley for 2013-2014. And he ended up getting fired in the his after his fourth or fifth year. I mean, maybe not fired, but it's not let none this not time back. And he was trying to build a culture. He was trying to build a winning culture. It's just it was it was tough. It was it was extremely tough. Uh, we didn't live up to expectations. We didn't we didn't win. Um and then once he was gone, they brought in they brought in uh and actually during that time, my four years there. I had two owners, three offensive coordinators, three head coaches, and six quarterbacks. It's hard to build a culture when you have that much transition. We have that much changing over and over and over again. So after I left, uh, I think they just drafted Blake Bortles in 2014, and then they brought in Tom Coughlin in like 2015 or 16, or 2015, I think. And then that's when they really started to have like like a culture of, hey, we're going to do things the hard nosed way. We're going to do things this way, that way. And and they wound up going to the AFC championship. But now, to be honest, it looked like it's backfiring. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. it was a little too hard nosed, a little too old school because Jalen Ramsey spoke on it. Um, You knock, uh, what's Yannick, knock, what's the defense in? No, I can't say his name. Yannick um, and Doc He is, he is trying to get out of Jacksonville. You know what I mean? They just traded Calais Campbell. It seems yeah. like they're trying. They seem like they're trying to start all over. It talk, talks about getting rid of Leonard Fournette, so it seems like they're trying to start all over again. Yeah, I, know, I know, man. Um, you, you bring in, dude. you bring in Nick Foles. He plays one game. You play the rookie who goes six and who goes, uh, you know, does decently. Then you bring Nick Foles back for a game or two. Oh, he's not playing well. Well, he just got back. Like, give give him a fair shot. Um, yeah, you they gave him all his money. And then you trade him. And I, I like Minshew. I think Minshew has some talent. I don't know if he's the guy, but he has some talent. But it seems like, sadly, they're starting to rebuild. And Minshew is going to be at the front of it. And, okay, if it doesn't work out, guess what? They can get rid of Minshew for, for nothing. You know what I mean? So I'm hoping it works out there. Um, I still think they're building a culture. I don't think they had a culture since they fired Jack Del Rio, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, so I still think it's, it's, it's they're trying to build one. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm with you, man, because, like, they had the talent, you know. They had Ramsey, and now Fournette might be leaving and Campbell's, Campbell left, but I don't know, man. It's We'll see. We'll see. Um, yeah. I guess the last question I, uh, we can end on this is, what was your favorite place to eat uh, in Jacksonville, in Duval, I guess? Cause she's Metro from- Diner. Metro Diner. Can you hear me? Say, say that again, sorry. Metro Diner. All right, Metro Diner. Sweet. Yeah, it was a nice breakfast spot. Um, I don't remember what side of town it was on, but it was really, really good. Like, we used to go there all the time to eat Metro. Like a little mom and pop type store or type mm-hmm. restaurant. Dope, though. Great yeah. food, great <laughs> service. Always packed. It was it was a spot. Yeah. Hey, yo, now I'm getting hungry after that one, bro. <laughs> you know, thanks so much for taking the time, man. Your career was, you know, it's, it's unreal, man. Division three. And then, you know, to have the success you had, I mean, uh, super inspiring. So keep it up. Um, hey, Pats will welcome you with open arms, man. Anytime. <laughs> you know, I would love to, man. But my, but the way my knee feels, I don't know if I can go out there and do anything. I got one route for you. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man. Hey, man. We'd love to have you come through. So <laughs> appreciate you taking the time, man. And uh, hey, wish you the best during you know this crazy, uh, this weird circumstance. So uh, hope to stay in touch and wish you the best for sure. Hey, no problem, man. Thanks for having me on and keep going, bro. Keep going. You're doing awesome, brother. Yeah, thanks, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. God bless. Have a good one. Yeah, you too.